Well, hello and welcome to this Climate Now live debate on how to boost Europe's wind energy sector here on Euronews YouTube channel. My name's Jeremy Wilkes. I'm a science reporter at Euronews, the host of our monthly Euronews series, Climate Now, giving you the facts from Copernicus on how our planet is changing. Have a watch on euronews.com slash climate now. Let me introduce our guests who are here to discuss exactly how Europe is going to ramp up its wind energy capacity by 2030. We'll be talking about permits, we'll be talking about turbine technology, we'll be talking about smart grids and hybrid solar and wind power, and we'll be trying to understand exactly what happened when Europe experienced a kind of wind drought last year, last year trying to understand the implications also of climate change on wind resources and variability here in Europe. So I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Samantha Burgess, the Deputy Director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service, Carlo Zorzoli, the Head of Business Development at NL Green Power, Kenneth Thompson, the Head of the Wind Turbine Design Division at the Danish Technical University, Dr. Hannah Bloomfield, a Research Associate in Climate Risk Analytics at the University of Bristol, and Morten Helvig Peterson, a Danish MEP, the Vice Chair of the European Parliament's ITRA Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, and the Rapporteur on the Offshore Renewable Strategy that was adopted by the European Parliament in February 2022. And if you're watching this live now, please feel free to send us your questions in the chat uh, or on social media using the hashtag ClimateNow. And we've already started to receive them. I'll get them through here on my phone and I'll pass them on to our guests. But first, I want to kind of give a bit of context, I suppose, for the situation as it stands at the moment. Morton, why do we need to increase wind energy capacity in Europe so much and why do we need to accelerate? Well, we've seen... Uh, no, first of all, Jeremy, thanks for, for having me today. I've been looking forward to, uh, to, to, to this very much. So, obviously, we have these extremely frightening reports coming out of the IPCC uh, showing the magnitude of, of the issues and challenges ahead of us in, in order to combat climate change. And adding to this, uh, the terrible war in Ukraine uh, demonstrates uh, and, and shows us that, that we have to have real European independence from uh, gas imports from uh, from Russia. All this leading obviously to 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 at a European level looking for ways to increase production of renewables dramatically. And and this obviously leads to to uh, uh, to offshore wind, uh, to onshore wind, PV, other sorts of renewables. We, we're going to see new measures in terms of energy efficiency in order to uh, reduce uh, gas imports from from russia so uh, the ramp up needed uh, on, on renewables and, and not least on, on on wind is is really dramatic and, and the new thing is is that we see that this notion this issue of renewables uh, is is becoming security policy basically it's becoming yeah. of european strategic interest to ramp up production of renewables because we need it in order to combat climate change and we need it in order to become totally independent of, of gas imports. So and that's, that's a lot kind of, of new to have that sort uh, of alignment, this, right? The, to have that alignment yes. between those two things pushing in the same direction seems to be new, um, of course, because of the geopolitical situation. Uh, but Carlo, can the wind energy industry actually respond to this? Are you able to source the turbines? Are you able to get the permits in order to do what Morton's talking about? Well, first and foremost, of course, we, we totally agree the, the solution will be uh, a portfolio of technologies, uh, all renewable and sustainable, that need to, let's say, fuel the growth of Europe without fossil fuels. As far as wind is concerned, the wind is a technology that was really born in Europe. It's a, it's a European technology. I don't think today the bottleneck for wind development in Europe or elsewhere is the supply of equipment, although some disruption in supply chain do happen and as far as our experience is concerned permitting and local acceptance are as of today the main bottleneck time it takes time to get a permit and then to build the power plant and so if we look at the average time to get a power plant permit and it's not just for wind the same applies also for solar uh, we see that we're already late I mean, uh, if we were... I hope it can be years and years and years before you get a permit. Yes, I, I would say that based on our experience, uh, at least in the countries where we operate, you know, we are more present in Southern Europe and, and let's say Romania, Greece, uh, for a wind farm, it can take easily on average five, six years to get oh, yeah. permits. Uh, 
with some countries faring better, other faring worse. I mean, this is a, an average, as all averages, there's, there's variations. In solar, it's a little better, but still we see two and a half to three years, which again is, is a lot. It's well, a lot I understand that we should try to keep that at around a year or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the case Absolutely. of is, uh, is is worrisome. And countries that were faring very well because of the overwhelming number of also requests are slowing down. I mean, there were countries that were reasonably fast and they're slowing down. A lot of simplification processes are ongoing in various countries. And I think it's really needed if we want to get rid of our dependence and accelerate the growth of renewables. And to 2030, it's a huge challenge. But then if we think 2050, the challenge is even bigger because Absolutely. much more will need to be done in the following decades. We, well, we can. We're, and please ask your questions. Um, uh, all of those who are watching now, I heard that the chat was disabled, but it's uh, enabled now. So please, you can send through your questions. Uh, and particularly, I know that this is a hot topic on permits. Um, Samantha, so we know the wind industry needs to expand quickly. What's the role of climate data um, to, to help them do that? Good morning. So climate data is incredibly important to understand uh, the potential wind uh, generation capacity, but also to understand the variability through space and time. So when you look at any um, uh, resource, then you really need to understand um, the, the viability of that resource and, and how much variability there is naturally. And then we, we have the impacts of climate change that influence how that variability changes. So in the case of wind, um, according to the, the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change, they have determined uh, through scientific robustness that some parts of the world, wind uh, energy will increase, uh, wind energy potential will increase, and some parts of the world it will decrease. Um, there's a large amount of uncertainty in terms of where that will occur, but this is why climate monitoring is so important to understand where and when and how frequently that variability occurs. Yes. Absolutely. And that's something we're going to have a good chat about. And um, Hannah, you're, you're an expert in this and you've already been working on how to, how to manage variability. What are the key lessons that can be learned? I know you've worked a lot in the UK. What are the key lessons that, that, can, that have already been learned on how to deal with variability? Yeah, good morning. Um, it's the, very ch the challenge of wind really is trying to work out how we manage this variability. And I think one of the key things we've been learning is variability on lots of different time scales could be problematic. I think for the UK particularly, I think it was first noticed in 2010, we had a very low wind year. And that's when the wind industry started to think about climate variability. You know, and was this a normal year? Could this happen every year? And um, through working with meteorologists, you can you can confirm that actually, no, there were reasons where it was low and we understand understand the climate drivers of this but other time scales you know on, on a day-to-day -day basis we all know the wind is very variable we have storms that pass through we have periods where it isn't very windy at all and working with meteorologists to manage this variability and understand maybe clever spatial deployments of wind turbines to help manage this I think is a really key future question yeah um, and Kenneth what's the what's the what are the big innovations at the moment in turbine technology because if i've understood quickly it, it, it it's a very fast moving kind of business basically that you're always improving your turbine design what's kind of hot at the moment yeah exactly it has been a tremendous uh, development during the uh, past decades but it's uh, still ongoing and it has a huge potential when we look into this uh, you can say uh, uh, energy transformation uh, where wind definitely will be the backbone of the energy system. Uh, variability, as have been mentioned, is a key issue and, and uh, that needs to be handled in various uh, levels or different perspectives. Also from a turbine technology perspective, where the turbine itself can be developed into, um, uh, for instance, a low wind turbine where it's uh, more constant wind at uh, lower wind speeds. So that reduces the variability that, that's one example of how uh, the individual turbine can be designed uh, conceptually to, uh, to mitigate that variability. But it also goes for how wind farms are operated. So the control of wind farms, how wind is um, 
you can say, uh, operated in relation to other energy sources and different other assets. Um, that, that's an extremely uh, high focus area, how to control that, uh, the entire energy system with, with wind as a big, big contributor to that. We, we've just um, started to get some of the first questions coming through and I'll, we'll go back to talking about variability a bit more. But this one we've had from Annabelle um, saying, well, there's a climate and geopolitical emergency at the moment. Why was Europe late to act on renewables and the development of clean energy? And what can we learn from this to ensure we're faster, and more proactive in the future? Um, Morton, I believe that you've written a book about your frustrations of dealing with European energy policy. Perhaps the time for a rant about that is now. Um, and I think that might be what she's hinting at. Yeah, but but uh, for sure, this is a wake up call. And, and I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, we should have done this uh, years ago. Uh, I mean, what, what we are doing now is basically sponsoring Putin's war machine because we haven't built up with renewables or been good enough in, in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, so, I mean, clearly this is a wake up call and, and there should be a sense of urgency in adopting uh, measures accordingly in terms of, of, of high ambitions on the Green Deal that we're negotiating and, and ensuring also on permitting issues that we get this right. Because as, as Carlo rightly uh, said, uh, things are simply taking too much time, too long time. And, and what has taken us here is not going to, to take us where we want to get by by 2030 or even 2050 if we do not uh, decrease time uh limits uh, if we do not decrease times and uh, uh, limits in order to obtain permits so for sure, this is a of to, there was a bit of an effort to do that with the repower eu initiative that basically said it was a strategic imperative basically right and that was is a kind of effort to speed up the process wasn't it yes uh and and mid-may we'll see new initiatives coming out of the european commission that we will eventually have to negotiate in european parliament and, and one of the things that I'm pushing for is that within the confines of the Renewable Energy Directive, that we reopen some of the articles on permitting specifically. And my thought is that, uh, and I'm very open to all kinds of suggestions and ideas on this, that we have to introduce some sort of time limits, because if not, then we see uh, developments all over Europe where it'll take six, eight, ten years time to, uh, to do, uh, to do renewable projects. So, yeah. It's and what, what would you time. say would be a kind of a time limit? Would it be a, a matter of months or would it be a year or would, what would you think would be credible? So currently we are working with, with two year time limits uh, and, on permitting, but that does not include all the admin stuff uh, in this. Uh, so I, my thought is that to introduce a time limit, say two year plus one. So maximum of three years before you're ready to go. It's something along those lines that we need. It might be too drastic, it might be too radical, but uh, I, I, and I'm very open to all kinds of suggestions. Problem being that today, it simply takes too long time. So two plus one years would be my idea, my thought. One of the questions we've also had, which is gonna feed into variability, which is my kind of my pet um, subject because I just find it fascinating, is somebody's asking um, on our YouTube chat, which are, uh, no, it was Instagram. Sorry. Thank you for the questions on Instagram. Uh, which countries in Europe are best suited to wind power? Um, and I'm going to ask Sam to attempt to explain what I saw in the Copernicus uh, European State of the Climate report um, that came out just a few weeks ago that talked about a kind of wind drought that happened in northwestern Europe last year and which did have an effect on the energy markets as well and which was appeared to be quite significant. Samantha, can you kind of explain what happened? Yes, of course. So obviously wind is part of the weather phenomenon that we experience every day. And one of the challenges with wind variability is, or any variability in weather phenomena, is, is recognising the, the difference between what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis versus what we experience over long-term trends. So when we talk about variability, we're comparing what happened in 2021 with a 30-year average. So if we look towards what we saw in Europe um, over the course of 2021, for the Copernicus climate data, we use a product called Reanalysis, which is uh, combining uh, the latest numerical weather model with um, data assimilated from observations from the atmosphere, from the ocean, from the land surface, and all of that is combined together where we have over a million of observations per hour that are being built into to this big reanalysis. 
And this means that we can understand everywhere in the world with, with spatial uh, homogeneity. So what we saw in uh, 2021, we saw some of the lowest wind conditions uh, over the last 40-year uh, period, in uh, particularly in areas of Western Europe. So we're looking at countries like Ireland, like the UK, Germany, Denmark and Czechia all had uh, winds that were up to 10% lower than their annual average over that last 40 year period. And we then can actually that, bring up the map, actually, the graphic. Let's bring up sure. the map to, to show that and you can talk us um, through okay. it. Here we go. Of course, and, and scientists always like speaking to pictures, then that makes my life much easier. And what you can see from this map, so the, the blue colors are less wind, the, the red and, and warmer colors are more wind. And what you can see really clearly is in the North Atlantic, uh, over the UK and Germany, as I described, it's blue. And it's particularly blue in the summer. So in the, the June, July, August, and in the, the autumn as well, it's particularly blue in those regions. If so I'm reading really, that correctly, it's like a 15 to 20% less wind across the UK and Ireland in July to September last year. Is that right? That's correct. So overall, those countries are a 10% lower over the course of the year than the, the previous years in terms of their, their multi-year average. But uh, looking at the variability over the summer, then the particular region that's dark blue is up to 20% less than that, that average uh, time span. How can we explain what happened there? Is that, is that climate change? I'm going to ask you the, the million dollar question. Is that climate change doing that? So... Yes and no. U ultimately, it's incredibly challenging to unpick what is uh, the influence of increased uh, human emissions in the atmosphere versus weather dynamics. And, and really, you need to um, have distance from those weather events to really understand scientifically the, the influence of the, the warmer, wetter atmosphere compared with weather conditions that we can see normally. So you know, we know that there was a large uh, blocking high, which created that stillness over, over regions of the North Atlantic. That can happen without climate change, but did a warmer, wetter atmosphere due to those high anthropogenic emissions make it more likely that that high didn't break down and was in place for, for a long period of time? We kind of don't know the answer to that question for the time being then. Some scientists are really looking into it, but that's not the role of the Copernicus Climate Change Service. Uh, Hannah, what, can I bring you in on this one? It, was, was what happened last year with this wind drought, was that normal? <laughs> Yeah, so I think I, I totally agree with everything Sam said. It's not it's not normal, you know. As you say, it's one of the lowest wind events in the last forty years. So it's it's an extreme. And for me, I think it actually came at the perfect time because it came in the lead into COP twenty six, the Conference of Parties, where we were about to talk about um, the UK government was saying we're going to build eighty gigawatts of new wind energy. It's going to be wonderful. And I think it was a really um, almost poignant reminder from our atmosphere about the variability we have and I yeah. think it's important to think about it in the context because it did happen across the summer and this is the time of year where generally we have lowered wind generation um, as a whole um, so it, it it was a very prolonged period of low wind it was very unusual but it, it came at a time where generally we expect less energy from the wind. I'm, so I'm, I'm thinking that I mean the, the, the targets we're talking about from Brussels mm -hmm are to get to 50% of wind energy uh, for electricity demand by 2030, if I'm correct. What mm -hmm. happens then if you have one of these wind droughts? Uh, maybe, Carlo, I can bring you in on that one. If What happens if you have a wind drought? How do you fix it as an operator? Can you oh. get some electricity from somewhere else? I mean, oh. the campaigners will always say, you know, pro-wind people will say it's always windy somewhere in Europe. But how do you manage it? It's also sunny somewhere in Europe. And <laughs> That's true. A lot. <laughs> So to be honest, as an operator and an investor in renewable energies, I think the secret is geographical diversification, technical diversification, mixing different technologies, hybridizing power plants, that's something we didn't mention yet. And then what is variability? Uh, if you have a serial defect on the, a fleet of nuclear reactors in a country in Europe, maybe you can have a, a worse event than uh, lowers wind, wind speeds for a certain period of time, meaning variability is embedded in any electric, electricity system. Even with thermal generation, there was variability. 
there is variability of load. We didn't talk about load. Uh, demand response, smart loads are also part of the game. We need to think of an integrated system where generation, grids, and loads cooperate among each other. Of course, in a heavily decarbonized world, storage will have to pay to play a very significant role. There's no do, doubt. Do you think that's how we fix it? In fact, is by making hay while the, while the sun is shining, as we say in English, by making the energy when you've got lots of wind and then storing it. Is that what the world's going to look like even by 2030? We'll be doing that a lot more. Well, uh, for for daily variability, for sure. I mean, I have no doubt about it. For long, long term seasonal variability, again, interconnection between areas will help a lot. Uh, in some areas, there is a decent correlation between wind and sun, meaning when in coastal areas, you have wind regimes in the evening and in the morning, you know, because of the thermal difference between the earth and the ocean. Yeah, and that you can predict and it's pretty much always going to happen, right? More or less, you know, and, and, and also you need to build buffers. I mean, yeah, uh, the concept of reserve margin, meaning having more installed capacity than, than the one you really need is, again, is key in the planning of area energy system. And maybe there will be some limited uh, scope, I, I, I say limited, uh, but in, and in the long future, I mean, think about 40s, the 50s, to some thermal generation with synthetic fuels or hydrogen linked fuel just in case. Okay. But that should not be the, the main use of hydrogen, for instance, because we need to use it not to burn it into a turbine. We need to use it to abate the hard to abate sectors. Um, I, um, I've got two Danes here, and Denmark is very reliant on wind energy. Um, it, was the wind drought last year a concern in Denmark, or did you just kind of say, OK, that's just part of weather and we can handle it? If, if I may, Morten, then uh, it was a concern, obviously. It uh, impacted the uh, energy prices, and it was uh, simultaneous with uh, lack of hydropower from uh, Norway and Sweden. So that was, uh, of course, a concern. I think uh, a key word in, uh, in what you said, uh, Carlo, is uh, diversity. Uh, and th that is really the solution to many things. Uh, and also uh, use uh, wind and other energy sources uh, for different use cases. One thing you just briefly mentioned, Carlo, is the uh, power to X, where we generate um, uh, fuel uh, gases or, or, or liquid fuel uh, with green energy. And, um, and then uh, also are able to use it different places, but also store it. So I think that is uh, part of the solution. So is, is that happening now? Can you can you get a wind turbine that will also make you some, I don't know, some biofuels or something at the base of it already? Is that technology exist? I would say, yes, it does. Uh, all the elements of that is well-known technologies. It's been well known for electrolyzers for years. Uh, to, to, to use it as a combined optimal system, that is um, uh, in the prototyping stage, I would say, but being rapidly developed. So it's something that really will uh, influence the energy system uh, in the yeah, near future. I want to go back again to uh, um, one of the other graphs that we had, which was related to where it was windier and where it was less windy. Let's just quickly run through this one. Again, this was from uh, the State of the Climate Report. And this shows that last year it was a lot windier in Greece, Estonia, Italy, Bulgaria. I mean, windier than average, much less so as we saw already. We focused on the negatives in the UK and Ireland and Czechia and Denmark. Um, but I'm wondering, does this kind of indicator, can we read something into that? Or is that, again, is that just <laughs> is that just variability? When we look at that, it was windier in Greece, but next year, who knows? Uh, if I can jump in on that one, I think, uh, again, what, oh, apologies, um, what Morton and um, uh, Carlo were saying is incredibly important. So we can see here that um, some countries in Eastern Europe and in um, the Mediterranean were windier than average. So this means it's incredibly important for that diversification of energy sources rather than uh, looking at the traditional wind generation countries and only investing in those areas of Europe. The reality is that there is wind energy generation potential all across Europe, 
along with other renewable energy sources, such as some of the ones we've already mentioned this morning. So having that diversity in place so that you can take advantage of wind when it is present, of sun when it is present, of hydropower um, and, and manage for it to be active when it's required is incredibly important. And in addition... Uh, uh, Morton, I'm, 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 we, we're building a picture of a, a world where well, we can perfectly integrate and agree with each other, but across the EU27 and the UK, because of course we share wind power with them as well, just, are we capable of getting on and being nice to each other and managing this system? Um, or how is it all going to fall apart? <laughs> fall apart? Well, uh, hopefully, yes, uh, we are. We have uh, mutual interests uh, in, in, in this, so hopefully that should be done in a, in a peaceful way. I think what is what is striking, though, is 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 that w that we at a, a pan-European level, we are quite bad in terms of integrating our markets. Uh, I mean, we do not have an internal market, despite the fact that that this corporation was built to uh, maintain access to coal and steel. We we, we still do not have a really a functioning uh, internal market in electricity, for that matter. I mean, we see that the cross-border flows of energy are, are highly limited. Uh, we don't use the capacity already there, and we will need adding capacity cross-border, uh, doing hybrid projects, be it in North Sea or Baltic Sea or Mediterranean or wherever. So coming back to the, the is, is slide. Is that because of corporate saw... interests? Is that corporate interests? Is that political interests? Or is it just because nobody can both, be bothered? To... Both. Yeah, yeah, both. And, 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 and planning and executing on, on this is just so bloody difficult. It sounds too easy to do, but agreeing on everything from infrastructure to network codes to uh, you know, sharing burdens and, and costs uh, when investing, etc., uh, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's it's quite difficult to do infrastructure right, to do the right market design, uh, and to do permitting. So I mean, you have all sorts of issues in there that is making things complicated and 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 time consuming. Problem being, obviously, that we do not have time enough. You're in the heart of the Brussels machine now. Have you seen a change this year um, because of the geopolitical situation and that MEPs at least? Um, are more keen to cooperate and to try and make this this cooperation we're talking about happen. I I, I would hope to be able to say yes to this question. Uh, I mean, we were in the midst of negotiating uh, some of the very important directives on, on on this. I'm hoping and pushing for this leading to higher ambitions and higher speed in this transition because this is uh, what we're uh, what we need. And and coming back to the permitting issue, this is a very specific example of an issue where I hope to see a change in approach, given that we have to decrease all this time spent on, on, on the issuance of, of permits. And that requires, again, much more coordination and alignment between the various policy priorities on biodiversity, on you know green ocean strategies, uh, blue ocean strategies, what have you, uh, aligning this with the ramp up needed uh, be it in, in offshore renewables uh, to, 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 that, to, to make that case. But this would equally apply to PV or to on land or, or to other sorts of, of renewables as well. I'm going to get into some of the questions we've been receiving from people. I just want to point to a, a Euronews Green poll that we carried out on Twitter uh, asking, would you be happy to see wind turbines on the skyline in your area? Um, this 84% of people said yes actually, and uh, only 16% said no, they spoil the landscape. But we have had questions about how to make them, I suppose, less visually present on the landscape, which takes me to um, talking to, to Kenneth about this question of related to some of the questions we've already had on uh, from online, which is how do you how are they going to evolve in the future? Are they going to get bigger? Are we going to see wind turbines that are kind of less visible and less kind of um, present, I suppose, visually? Or is, is that not really a, a question for you in the turbine technology? Yes, and we have seen uh, many attempts to uh, estimate how, when, when will we hit the limit of the growth of turbines? Uh, no one has they're literally getting bigger and bigger at the moment. Yeah, yes. I, what we see is, uh, you could say, we see two different trends. We see one uh, onshore on, on land and we see another one on uh, offshore. And for offshore, it seems like the race is going on uh, continuously. Uh, and it's really, really difficult to, uh, to estimate what will be the limit. Uh, at some point, of course, uh, 
things that is not directly related to the turbine itself, but to the transportation, to the installation and, and handling, kicks in and makes things complicated. Um, but we see uh, continuously growing uh, offshore turbines. Onshore, we see um, a tendency to uh, a leveling off in the size of the turbines, which is natural. And, uh, and focusing also on other elements like noise and, um, and visual impact and things like that. So you're able to make them quieter? Yes, that's a high priority uh, research area. Uh, many places in industry and, uh, and, and uh, in labs and universities as well to focus on how to um, reduce the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the noise emission. Uh, from from turbines. That, what, that, what about what about the visuals? I mean, can can you because I suppose there's also the concern of um, a lot of people who are you know rightly concerned about birds being hit by them, and and I believe there are you know ways around that in terms of technology and things. But also, can you fix that problem while also making them less maybe of a kind of visual presence? Well, all all of that is uh, that that's research areas as well, and there are uh, progress on that and and different technical solutions to that. Uh, uh, not to the you can say the visual part, but to the, uh, the impact on on wildlife, which is of course uh, very important. Um, it's difficult to say how how that will uh, evolve in the future, but of course it it has to be uh, solved. And we've had a question here asking about um, the co comparison with tidal power. I don't know if anybody fancies that one. Um, is wind power better than? power harvested from the tides. I suppose the issue with tidal power is nobody's really made it work very successfully on a big scale yet. Um, but are those technologies going to come forward? We talked about using other kinds of renewables, uh, mixing in with solar and whatever. Is, is tidal going to start competing with wind or is it just never really going to get there? I think for now it's an unfair competition, but uh, because wind is so much more efficient, uh, but, uh, but in in, you can say in the name of diversity in uh, energy sources, uh, tidal could uh, for sure some places play a big role. Well, I guess it doesn't have the same issues uh, that you might have with variability in the same way. Um, another question we've had, which is asking about improving efficiency and retrofitting existing turbines. So is, is that something that needs to happen as well? Because we're talking about rolling out more type turbines in the future, but I guess we need to do something with the ones we've already got to make them better too, right? Exactly. If, if I can start on that one, um, I, I would say we need to do uh, several things. We need new uh, capacity installed. We need uh, a repowering and uh, you can say lifetime extension of the existing uh, assets. And then we need a replacement of some of the old ones with the new, more modern, uh, much more efficient turbines. The uh, First turbines installed many years back were typically installed on the very uh, wind richest uh, areas. And of course, those have to be replaced uh, because we have an upside in, uh, in using much more uh, efficient technology. So I think we need to see uh, all sorts of, of, um, of uh, development in the future in order for us to meet the target of this electrification. We've also had questions related to offshore versus onshore. Um, as you've already said, um, offshore is just going bigger and bigger, enormous now. And I've had the pleasure to go and see some of these offshore wind farms in the North Sea, and they are truly impressive places. But that, from what I've understood, the growth is going to be in onshore. Um, and I guess that that's a question of cost as well. What are the comparisons we can make, Morton, between offshore and onshore? Um, offshore is just seen as expensive, but there's plenty of wind out there, and I'm, I'm sure that Samantha and uh, and Hannah will tell us. Yeah, well, uh, I think we, we have to be open to, to all technologies and, and all options on, on, on this, and, and I think it's it's important also to be open to be a tidal or, or also floating offshore, which is hopefully going to decrease in price over the next uh, uh, five, ten years or so, and hopefully uh, becoming competitive with the fixed problem installations that that we would see in, in North Sea or, or, or the Baltic. So I, I think we should, uh, generally speaking, be open to uh, to all kinds of, of of renewable technologies out there, and 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 hopefully seeing and realizing the same dramatic fall in costs that we've seen offshore and onshore and PV over the last five, ten years. Because this is also something. This is also a sort of a. a, a a mindset, a change in mindset and approach that that you see 
wind uh, and, and renewables from wind not any longer being some sort of you know uh, North European hippie experiment, but being really a big business and 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 the cheapest source of energy if you go greenfield today. So this is also a a different mindset compared to where we were like five, 10 years ago. So we need to keep all, keep all op options open. Also in exploiting, say, Mediterranean or the Atlantic or, or the Black Sea in terms of, of floating uh, uh, offshore to, to take that example as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to bring in Carlo on that one because I know that NL Green Power is, is pretty much focused on, on land um, and you're building um, turbines in the south of Italy at the moment and installing them there. To what extent... Does there is do you see a big difference between southern Europe and northern Europe in terms of the kinds of technologies that will develop in the future? Well, first, if you allow me, I would like to just get back a second on the repowering uh, part, which I think is very, very relevant. Uh, and there is a very interesting link between repowering and visual impact, because those old turbines that have been installed 20, 15, 25 years ago in the very windy sites, happened to be very small but very crowded because the, the design back then was uh, pretty crowded. So you had this kind of visual impact of smaller turbine, but a lot of them. Now, the very same site, on average, you can install 60 to 70 percent less turbines, truly bigger, but way less in numbers. So at the end, I'm not so sure that the visual impact is so much worse. And you are already developing an industrial site, which is not often recognized in the laws because you have to restart permitting as if nothing were there, while you should do a differential analysis of how you are improving the visual, you are improving the bird uh, impacts, meaning reducing, <laughs> not <laughs> increasing. You are reducing noise, etc., 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 and you get much more energy. So truly important to safeguard those good old wind sites and understand that, yeah, they're bigger, but there's going to be so less of them that overall it's going to work. And I think regulation needs to work a lot also on this one to make it easier. In a lot of places, most of the places I know, you don't consider it com to compare to the existing situation. You have to repermit as if nothing were there, which is a little but bit... It, is, there, is there going to be a kind of a north-south divide in terms of w where they're going to be, um, in terms of, you know, that we'll get a lot more offshore in the well, North Sea, because we you know, uh, in renewables, location means a lot. I mean, uh, you cannot do solar power where there is no sun, and you have to do wind power with wind. So, generally speaking, Northern Europe has better wind resource and worse solar resource, and there's shallower waters which are more beneficial to to, to wind offshore. Southern Europe has lower winds, even offshore and very deep waters. I mean, you, the, the bathymetry doesn't help. So I personally see less scope for offshore in Southern Europe than in Northern Europe. But that's the beauty of an integrated continent and integrated grid and being part of the community. I think each and every one of us shall contribute to the energy transition with the most competitive resources, because that's also the only way to have a just transition. Because if we are going to impose expensive technologies where they don't work so well and there are better alternatives than somebody has to foot the bill. And yeah, yeah, it's not going to be an easy sell, is it, politically at all, if it's uh, if you're installing fancy wind turbines? As much as I, I think there will be more solar in Italy, in Spain, in Greece uh, than in Scandinavia, but that's nature. I mean, it's... it's we, not we, we've kind of talked about mixing up the two together in the same place and i'm on one of, again going back to this question of variability is that one of the ways to fix it sam is it kind of okay to say from a scientific point of view what i would imagine to be the case which is that when uh there is not an awful lot of wind it does tend to be sunny is is that the case or is that actually a bit wrong that, that's mostly fair. So um, in addition to monitoring wind variability, the, the state of the climate also monitors suns, sunshine duration and radiance, so how much energy the, the Earth receives. And that has gone up through time over the last 40 years as well. So Europe is getting sunnier, which is great news for a lot of people. But we really need to look at this uh, diversification. And, and I think Europe integration policies as well. Europe is getting sunnier. How did how did that happen? 
uh, the atmospheric changes due to greenhouse gases and you know. so we saw um for 2021 in particular um it, it was only slightly sunnier than average um but there were there was again quite large variability in where the the increased sunshine duration was so where where it was less cloudy uh, effectively so it, it's changes in cloud dynamics in the atmosphere that changes the the sunniness but generally if you allow me there's two other big points in mixing together technologies that i think are hugely important the first one is to make the best use of the interconnection to the grid if you have a wind farm with 30 percent capacity factor that interconnection point is used only 30 percent of the time so you have spare useless if you wish uh, infrastructure yeah. then if you hybridize on the same side with the solar uh, given the right conditions you can increase the utilization factor of that interconnection point meaning you can put more renewables in the grid without a grid expansion which we're not talking about today but it's also another issue <laughs> expanding the grid and that's the first point the second point is that it's unlikely that you have the sunniest and windiest place in the same place. So perhaps that solar farm that you're building at the side of a wind farm, you would not build it standalone because maybe it could not bear the interconnection cost. But since the interconnection costs have already been borne by the pre-existing wind farm, it would work also the opposite, of course. You can not only make better use of the grid, but you can also make feasible and cheaper at the end for uh, the electricity resources that otherwise you could not use that's why we think hybridization is is relevant it you seems to me that it's so, such an obvious thing to have done though to, why haven't we done this before to put the solar panels next to the wind farms you already got a permit to build these things nobody else is probably going to do anything much with that land why not put some so the fact, it goes with with the regulations. I mean, uh, some countries, for instance, provide you an interconnection right for a specific technology. So some is regulatory, but it's getting solved. Uh, historically, a lot of wind has been done on on cliffs. That's not very good for solar. So again, that's not doable everywhere. But I think we will see some of that uh, as part of. As part of the equation, I mean, the equation will be solved by many factors, and that's going to be one of the factors. Um, uh, Hannah, we, we often imagine that it's always windy at sea, but we've also seen from the information that we saw from Copernicus that that isn't necessarily always the case. Would would you say from from what you've the work you've done in the UK that that offshore is is actually maybe being uh, underestimated, and that in fact offshore is going to grow and do better? In, in the future because we can really pretty much rely on a windy situation out in the ocean or is, is that not the case is it's climate change implications putting questions on that yeah it's a good question if you kind of look at there's lots of resources now we can think about wind resource assessment using these really long records of climate data and offshore wind is um it, it's it's nearly always got a better um, kind of capacity factor it's got more potential than the onshore particularly in the north sea in europe it's one of the best places in the world to build a wind turbine um but you know as we as we saw in the summer it's not always windy at sea um and and we we need to be able um to plan for that and i think good spatial deployment you know it is really key and we've talked about interconnection already but um I think what's particularly important for countries like the UK is that often um, when we're experiencing, say, a peak demand, um, which we get in winter associated with these big high pressure systems, we don't have much offshore wind. Um, there are situations where we can have um, a good wind resource if, if you look through some of our big, big events, but we won't always have it. Um, so offshore is... It, is i mean something what, we need to what can about. actually happens in those situations you're talking about it being kind of very cold and still over that kind of north sea ireland area yeah exactly so we'll kind of get we get these areas of high pressure and if we get those in the winter underneath it, it can be very cold um and due to the the way the air is circulating um the, the, the air is coming off the continent basically we're getting lots of very cold air coming flowing at us from russia 
Um, so we've got lots of around Siberia. It's much colder than in Central Europe over winter. So there, very cold air flows in. Um, and depending on exactly where this high pressure system, system is located, we might have quite high wind. Um, so we had a situation in the UK in 2018, the beast from the east. Um, it was very windy um, then, actually, but it was also very snowy. So all our solar paddles got covered in snow and National Grid can do anything about that. Um, but there's there's lots of challenges around the peak, I think. And I think we have the tools to manage them all. Um, and the meteorologists have a very good understanding of these weather conditions now. So I think it's good collaboration. It's quite key here, I think, between the technical and the meteorological communities to kind of get this going. But from a kind of operational point of view, what does the UK or Ireland do? Is it just basically buying power from somewhere else at that point? Yes, yes. So we have quite a few interconnectors. So we're, we're connected to Ireland. So that probably won't help at this point. But we're also connected to France um, and now to Norway um, and the Netherlands. Um, when we looked at some of these events in the past, actually, um, although we've got very low wind, um, we found that, say, for the beasts for the east, um, it was it was quite sunny in France. If they would have had a lot of um, solar panels there, it would have been very easy for us to take power as well as the nuclear that we take in these in that situation from them. So um, it's although we say that you know, well, it's like that graph we looked at earlier where you could see the maps and you could see that southern Europe it's generally windy when it was not windy in northern Europe. There, there's always a resource somewhere um, yeah. in terms of the wind and solar resource. It's just matching up. Um, how we pass it around Europe is the key. I'm going to wrap things up soon, but I'm, I want to go back to Morton and just really, I suppose, the question in my mind, we need to get from 190 gigawatts of capacity today to 480 gigawatts by 2030. Do you think there's any chance we're going to achieve that? I hope so, uh, and, 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 uh, and this is why we need the, the, the permitting issues to be uh, resolved. Uh, by the way, on, on, on permitting, uh, I mean, you have a lot of countries all over Europe where this process uh, of, of applying for permits is still uh, based on, on, on paper. I mean, you see developers uh, uh, shipping and, and ferrying and busing uh, enormous amounts of paper paperwork to understaffed uh, authorities uh, being on a local or regional or national level. Uh, so, I mean, this entire process has to be rethought in terms of content and in terms of process, uh, in terms of, of digitalizing some of this stuff, uh, all this uh, in order to reduce uh, these uh, these time areas. But, you you so, think permitting so is, is the key, right? That is, that is it. It's not yeah. supply chain problems. It's just permitting. No, but there's a lot of issues, obviously, uh, and, and the infrastructural discussions on 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 capacities are, are, are critical. The market design related issues on on uh, on uh, on on, de on deploying further offshore renewables is is critical. But permitting seems to me to be the bottleneck. If I were to choose one, yeah. Thanks very much for that. A, a very interesting to get that insight. Um, uh, I suppose an another question in my mind, I suppose, is um. Uh, to do with this, the smartness of the grid, Carlo, can we build a smart grid that can do what we want to do? From a technical point of view, is, is it possible? To well, it's, make already, it's already under construction. I mean, it's not, it didn't start today. So yes, absolutely. Uh, when I talked about collaboration between generators, users, and the grid, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, you have a lot of loads in the electricity grid that can be to a certain extent can adjust to conditions. So like, just think about thermal or refrigeration loads. You can store electricity when there is a lot of wind and sun by pumping a little bit more on the either cooling or heating and then releasing when. So there's a lot of things that can be done. And again, there's no silver bullet. And the smart grid is very relevant because it needs to have coordinating the system also let's not forget that a lot of the new renewable energy will not be connected to the transmission to the big high voltage grid a lot of it is going to be distributed generation or quasi distributed on the distribution grid and that's where the full deployment of smart meters and smart devices is going to help the 
the transition. I mean, the country I'm from has been experiencing like more than 10 gigawatt per year solar expansion in the, let's say, golden days of the, of the about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And it has been done because we had already deployed a smart grid back then with no major issues. Candice, what, what do you think is the, the innovation that's going to help us to achieve those, those numbers to get to 480 gigawatts by 2030? Is it just building an awful lot of wind turbines or are we going to have big leaps forward in efficiency, do you think? We will for certain have leaps, whether it's going to be big leaps, I don't know, but um, even uh, marginal gains will have a big, big impact when we talk about this uh, volume. So I think we uh, for sure need to prioritize that, the, the further development of the technology itself. And then, of course, we also need to develop uh, other technologies like we talked about with uh, power to x and, uh, and, and other ways of uh, mm. transforming uh, electricity into energy sources and, and on the grid side, obviously. Um, one one uh, input on the uh, potential bottlenecks of this uh, development, when I talk to the uh, turbine manufacturers, so in the turbine OEM perspective, uh, supply chain issues and workforce issues uh, are mentioned often. So I would also add those to the list of uh, things to be worried about. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It seems, I know it's certainly a hot concern at the moment uh, for the wind industry, but I wonder whether that will pass we'll start making those wind um, turbines in Europe more, not so reliant maybe on China. I suppose, at least as far as I've understood, that's going to fix the problem a few years down the line, right? Yeah, that's that's uh, correct. And of course, what we have seen uh, on the wind business uh, is the same as we have seen in, uh, in other businesses, uh, that the industrialization happening in China and the dramatic cost reduction is also happening on turbines, uh, mm. uh, maybe with an impact on the quality. And of course, our, from a European perspective, uh, input to that or, or mitigation to that is to continuously to develop the technology. That is something we continuously have to do in order for us to ensure that we get better turbines and we also get, uh, you can say, European uh, made turbines. Um, Hannah, what kind of research do you think needs to be going on at the moment or is already going on that's going to really help us to achieve that, that goal of getting to 480 gigawatts by the, by the end of the decade? From the meteorological community, I think there's kind of two key aspects. So the predictability is key. So whether that be a few hours ahead or maybe a season ahead, meteorologists are getting pretty good at this. You know, We can help manage this variability for prediction. Um, but the other aspect, I think, is through understanding these climate change signals. So I think when the latest IPCC report did come out saying, if you average over all the models, it looks like there is a decrease in wind speeds over Europe. Um, but our individual models can give very, very different responses. And I think from the meteorological community to give some confidence on what we think is more or less likely, um, I think would be really helpful. But not to bin wind power, but to be able to work with people like Kenneth to be like, do you know what, the resource potential might change in these regions. When we retrofit these wind turbines, we can make them relevant for the climate they're going to be in. And I think that for us would be really key to being most productive as a community. That's really interesting, which leads me to Sam. What do you think are going to be the climate change impacts that might come in and cause some problems with this rollout and this, this uh, kind of development, rapid development of wind towards this 480 gigawatt goal? I, I think it's incredibly hard to pinpoint the direct challenges that we face. We, we know there will be variability in any renewable energy, but also we know that the scientific um, evidence base is there, the, the technological base is there, uh, as we've heard from Kenneth and Carlo, and it's been there for a long time. And, and as uh, Hannah described, the meteorological understanding of climate predictions, of seasonal forecast, of weather forecasting is there as well. I think what we're missing is the societal pull for renewable energy and for energy security. And if there was a societal pull, you know, as an example, I used to be able to buy green energy. The company that I bought it from went bust 
So now I have gone back to the, the national energy supplier, which does not use green energy. And I don't have a choice in this because the energy market in the UK isn't viable for the small energy producers that were using sustainable energy. And I can't do anything about that except uh, wait for this energy crisis to be overcome so I can then choose to buy my energy from a new renewable provider again. But if we have more pull from society to say it's not good enough to not be able to buy renewable energy, to not have energy security, then it will become an increase, increasing political priority. From what I've understood, it is very much a political, a growing political priority in Brussels um, as well. And, and um, thank you, Morton uh, Helvig Peterson, for being with us on this uh, panel. Um, uh, I, I guess your a final thought and answer to what Sam had to say there. Do, do, do you think that that's going to happen? We're going to get that pull. Yes, I do. Uh, and and, and I, I truly believe that that uh, I mean, Ukraine is, is a wake up call, as well as the IPCC reports. Uh, showing how serious uh, this is uh, it is a real climate crisis out there and and we have to do our utmost in order to uh, to combat greenhouse gas emissions so these two uh, big uh, major geopolitical developments are hopefully going to lead to a uh, an increased sense of urgency and also action on these issues we have to do it Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for taking part in this debate, everybody. Uh, Dr. Samantha Burgess, Deputy Director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service, Carlo Zarzoli, the Head of Business Development at NL Green Power, Kenneth Thompson, the Head of Wind Turbine Design Division at the Danish Technical University, Dr. Hannah, Hannah Bloomfield, Research Associate in Climate Risk Analytics at the University of Bristol, and Morten Helvig Peterson, Danish MEP and Vice Chair of the European Parliament's ITRO Committee. Thanks very much for being with us. It's been really a pleasure to have you on this panel. And thanks to everybody watching, sending in those questions. And remember, you can see more and learn more about climate change and how it is changing our planet, really with all of the data, all of the facts on euronews.com slash climate now. And I'll see you soon. Thank you.